yeah, yeah. Thanks, Daniel. Um, thanks for being here, everyone. Uh, so today I'll be talking about a very recent work um, for solving planar min cost flow in nearly linear time. And um, this is joint work with um, a constant fraction of the people in this field, I would say. Um, okay, so let's start with the problem definition. Um, as most of you probably are familiar with, uh, min cost flow, um, the setup is as follows. So we are given a directed graph G with N vertices. And every vertex has some demand dv. And um, over the entire graph, the demand has to sum up to zero. So negative demands means that they can give out uh, flow value and positive demands means that they demand flow. Um, and every edge has some capacity u of e and also a cost c of e. And our goal is to find some flow that respects the capacity constraints and arouse the demand D. And by flow, of course, we mean something that satisfies flow constraints, which means that um, flow in uh, minus flow out is uh, the demand. And here we're minimizing the total cost, which is going to be uh, the inner product of C and F. Okay. Um, and planar min cost flow, obviously, is just uh, we're given a planar graph instead of any general graph. So there is the natural LP formulation for this problem, which uh, is as follows. So we're minimizing um, this uh, linear function, C transpose uh, F, and the B here is the sine adjacency matrix of the graph G. So um, you put negative one where the tail of your edge is and plus one for uh, the head of your edge. And um, so this B transpose F equals D is saying uh, the flow constraints, uh, flow conservation must be um, respected. And also we have that the flow must respect the capacity constraints. Really quick example, here we have some planar graph. Um, and so we have the capacities labeled in red and the costs uh, labeled uh, in blue. And so here what we're saying is we allow these um, bidirectional edges um, like so. And um, of course, here is just an example of a feasible flow. Um, kind of uh, algorithms 101 here. Um, so you can check that the flow values, uh, the demands are satisfied everywhere and we have the flow constraints. And this case is, this feasible flow is actually not the optimal, I think. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, maybe some of you are not aware, but max flow is actually, uh, can be written as a special case of mean cost flow, especially, um, we're talking about the regime of uh, doing convex optimization rather than um, necessarily uh, <coughs> combinatorial approaches. So here, how you should think of it is you're given um, a demand vector uh, where, um, so max flow here, we're talking about max X, ST flow. So we're sending one unit of flow from S to T and uh, the demand is going to be zero everywhere else. Then, um, the max ST flow is going to be equivalent to the following formulation. And you can see that um, the constraints here is very similar to uh, basically the same as mean cost flow. And the objective function we're minimizing is the infinity norm of F and the intuition is kind of like this. So you have um, some graph and rather than sending a lot of flow on one, uh, augmenting path, you could say, you wanna be kind of spreading out your flow uh, like all across your graph so that you can then kind of uniformly scale up the flow value on each edge until you hit the maximum capacity. And in this case, uh, I didn't put a capacity, but if you did have capacities, then you would have some scaling factor uh, inside here. Okay, um, since we're talking about special cases of mean cost flow, then Shortest path is also a special case of mean cost flow. 
And very similar to uh, MaxFlow, um, we have the same feasible set. And here, the objective function we're minimizing is going to be the L1 norm. So the longer your path is, um, obviously, uh, the flow is going to be the same value on every uh, edge. So the longer it is, the larger this L1 norm is going to be. Yeah, and again, we're sending one unit of uh, flow. Okay, um, and finally, so we've had uh, minimizing L1 norm and L infinity norm. So of course, there's also minimizing uh, L2 norm. And this corresponds to finding an electrical flow in the graph. And this is a little bit different. So here we don't have this. Um, uh, so again, we still have the same demand uh, at S and T. And what you should think of is, again, we have this graph. S and T. And what we're doing is we're attaching a kind of external battery. If you remember from your uh, high school physics days. And um, we're talking about still we need all the flow constraints to be satisfied. So basically uh, the demands are telling us that we're going to have kind of one unit of flow going into S and one unit of flow coming out of T. And within the graph, everything uh, should, um, you should satisfy the demands, which is zero everywhere. Uh, and what we're doing here is the solution is going to be of the form um, F is going to be, uh, you're going to take the Laplacian uh, inverse D and then uh, take um, B. So what this is doing is actually this is calculating some voltage, right? So basically you're putting a battery to your circuits. Oh yeah, and um, you should think of all the edges as having basically a little resistor on them of resistance one in this case. And um, right, so taking L inverse D is ca calculating the voltage at every vertex of uh, your circuit and then um, multiplying by B is going to be um, computing the flow. And so this result is indeed, uh, the, this result resulting F is indeed something that minimizes uh, the L2 norm. And you can check that it does satisfy B transpose F equals D because um, what do you get when you multiply by uh, B transpose F? You get this is equal to L and so, the L and L inverse cancels out and you get D at the end. Okay. Um, I think I was supposed to draw on that page. Okay, so some related works um, in terms of general graphs. Uh, so finding electrical flows uh, in nearly linear time was uh, quite an important piece of work done by Steel, uh, Spielman and Tang in 04. And um, a couple of years later, uh, we, so, Daesh and Spielman applied uh, IPM uh, to reduce min cost flow to solving uh, uh, square root and electrical flows. And overall, uh, because every electrical flow could take linear time, you get this n to the three halves time. And this n to the three halves time, oh, sorry, m, because m is the number of edges. Um, and this is kind of the best bound in general. And uh, this was this three halves barrier was broken by uh, Madri, again, uh, but only for unit capacity graphs uh, for max flow. And then it was later improved and generalized. And I should mention all of these basically are using IPM methods. And that they're kind of modifying the electric flow um, and maintaining the solution in some sort of clever way. Uh, for Sally, sorry. just to clarify, so uh, capital M is the largest capacity or cost or? Um, oh, uh, this is going to be, um, I guess M is going to be the max of, so cost vector and capacity. Yeah, some sort of scaling constant uh, for, yeah. 
Um, okay, then for general graphs, um, we have the current best Minkowski flow algorithm, um, which runs in this m plus n to the three halves time. And uh, for max flow, uh, for general capacities, we have something uh, a little bit better than three halves. So um, yeah, some of these uh, authors are in the audience and know about these a lot better than I do. And specifically for planar graphs, for max flow, this has been uh, basically a solved problem for a long time. You can do it in uh, basically nearly linear time. And for Minkos flow, however, um, there's still, uh, until this work, there's been quite a big gap uh, between the best and nearly linear time. So this O of, so for Minkos flow, this n to the 1.5 something, um, time algorithm, this one is using IPMs. And when they say square root and separable graphs, you can think of this as uh, generalization of planar graphs. And uh, the second one is for specifically unit capacity in n to the four third time. And this is not IPM. And I was actually surprised to find out about this. This is a purely combinatorial uh, paper. Okay, so that's it for uh, related works. And our result is basically saying that we can solve Minkowski flow in nearly linear time. Um, right, so M is going to be uh, defined as written. Uh, here's a quick comparison again with other runtimes. And our results actually generalizes to separable graphs because the only, uh, the only property we use about planar graphs is the fact that they are separable with separator size square root n. And since we only use the separab separability property, we can extend our um, results to other separable graphs. And this is the runtime approximately. So for us, we have uh, m plus square root m and square root n. Uh, Sally, just out of curiosity, does it, like for planar graphs, the, the square root n is relative to the, the size of the graph. So as it gets smaller, the separators also get smaller. Is yes. that important? In yes. This? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so in general, you can, in spirit, believe that the largest separator so what we're gonna do is recursively separate our graphs. And so this S here is going to kind of reflect the size of the largest separator. Okay, and the technique squeeze here is going to be a combination of the following. So we have um, robust IPMs, uh, nested dissection, which uh, some of you might not have heard of, um, we design new data structures to maintain the IPM solution, which is going to be of the form, the flow uh, and the slack. And we also have a sketching data structure to maintain some close approximation to our IPM solutions. And I'll explain how everything fits together in a little bit. And in this talk, I'm primarily going to focus on the nested dissection part with some robust IPM and data structures thrown in. Okay, so let's start with um, what the IPM is actually doing. So we start with this LP that we mentioned in the introduction, and we are going to actually reduce it to a different formulation. Um, and this is quite standard. And basically what we do is we are going to add a super source S and a super sink T and add extra edges so that all the source nodes in the original graph are connected to S and all the sink nodes are connected to T. And um, you also add another edge from S from T to S. Um, and so in this new linear program, we have all new uh, vectors and constraints. Uh, but we'll use the same notation for everything. And uh, the details are not very important, but 
um, the takeaway is still that if you can solve this uh, different formulation, then you can recover a uh, solution to the original. And you're going to be off by a little bit, but that can be fixed. So we're just going to talk about some IPMs right now. Um, so given this formulation, uh, on the right, we have the primal solution space, which is given by script F, and the dual solution space S. And we're going to use the central path defined here, uh, which um, is going to be kind of a log barrier central path. And as you already know by now, you're all IPM experts. When you take T to zero, you get the optimal solution. Okay, so um, let's look inside the box a little bit to what the IPM actually does at every step. So we'll define this projection matrix P of W. And at every step of the IPM, uh, what we're going to do is kind of we have this T, which is like the step, and you want T to zero. So we're going to update some H, which is going to be a function of our current solutions. Um, we have a weight matrix and we have some direction that we're going in. And we're going to update uh, our solution by uh, the following formula, right? So you have um, here the direction, you project it so that you get something that is feasible and you take a step in that direction. And similarly for us. And once you do this, you're also going to decrease the T by some factor of approximately one, over, one minus one over square root M. And this is what gives you this square root M um, steps. Okay. Um, and what we see is that at every step of the IPM, we are having to access our solutions F and S. And this is going to be very costly for uh, running our algorithm. So the first thing we can think of doing is um, let's not access uh, F and S and let's find some approximations to those solutions uh, so that we only make use of um, the approximations. And you can show that if you're close enough with these F bar and S bar, then this still works out. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay. So the next thing you notice is that um, this projection matrix P, maybe we can do something about that as well instead of computing it every step or computing it exactly. And in fact, um, you can do something. And what you want to do is find some close approximations, right? So we'll call them P tilde and P hat for now. And they also need to satisfy um, some conditions so that the steps that you're taking still remains feasible. Um, okay. And, uh -huh, okay. And the last thing we wanna do is basically at this point, uh, if you look at the pseudocode, we're, not, we're never actually accessing uh, F and S. Uh, at any step of the RPM, no, IPM, right? So we don't actually need the values of F and S ever. So we can do some sort of implicit maintenance for F and S. And we'll get to that a bit later. And um, with all those three, uh, we get basically uh, the robust IPM that we're going to use kind of as a black box for our algorithm. And the theorem with this complete statement is basically saying, um, yes, what I outlined so far works uh, and it works in the time that you'd expect. And also you have some sparse updates. Um, so in particular, uh, oh, sorry. So the update to W, and the update to V are going to only depend uh, coordinate wise. And as, 
um, meaning that uh, WI depends on and similarly with VI. Um, so actually, this part is fairly cheap to compute. If F bar changes by K coordinates, then we can update everything in uh, O of K time. Okay. Good. I don't know why I have so many copies of this thing. Okay, so remember I said uh, we can approximate projection matrices uh, by some approximate projection matrix. And this might help us to compute things faster. And um, we can't just approximate them with uh, anything. And we have to satisfy uh, the constraint, which is that what you get at in the end is has to be a feasible step. So when you uh, make a change to your uh, solution F, you need to stay within the feasible set. And um, I'm not going to write down the proof, but it's very straightforward. Uh, basically, you just have these conditions. Um, and so this is for the potential projection and then for the flow projection, um, what you need is the following. Okay, so. Sally, just yeah. out of curiosity, is there something sort of special about flow that makes this easy? Like in the sense that, uh, I mean, Jan was mentioning the other day that I guess in, in general, for, the, for a more general setup, like there was more pain in maintaining feasibility. Um, yeah, so we actually do something combinatorial to find uh, the flow step. So um, we're going to kind of be able to compute uh, this guy and it's going to be, um, we'll call it F tilde. And it, it has something to do with uh, the electric flow, right? And, and we can kind of, uh, based on our recursive decomposition of our graph, um, figure out how to route the demand um, in a way that might not apply to general problems. Okay. Okay, so um, just to keep this in mind, this projection matrix is very important, uh, but for now we are going to uh, switch topics and um, look at nested dissection. Okay, so um, let's begin with some basic definitions. So a balanced separator in a graph is basically uh, a set of vertices whose removal disconnects the graph and splits it into two components of uh, similar size. And the specifics is that each has size almost uh, two thirds of the original size. And it is a very well known fact that planar graphs have O of square root n size separators. Okay, so we know how to find a separator and now let's talk about how to recursively decompose a graph. And in this case, we're going to be talking about planar graphs. So here we have uh, a grid G. Um, so we find a separator S and clearly it's balanced. Right, so what we'll do is we partition the graph into uh, two parts. So we partition the edges and um, the vertices in the separator are copied uh, to both sides. And for the edges, you can partition them arbitrarily. And by that, I mean the edges of the separator, within the separator. And so we get these two um, subgraphs of G uh, which we call H and H prime. And the vertices uh, that we used to split up the graph, we call those the boundaries. And that'll be the vertices I've circled here. They're the boundaries of H. 
And similarly, on the other side, uh, those vertices are the boundaries of H prime. Okay, now we do this recursively. So in H, we find another balanced separator. And this time, the separator size uh, is going to be a function of the size of H, like Daniel mentioned earlier. And um, similarly, in H prime, we'll also find a balanced separator. And again, we uh, split up both uh, subgraphs into smaller subgraphs. And this time, um, we have an example of what the boundary of uh, a subgraph is. And intuitively, it's basically all the vertices at which you've, you've split at. OK. And so, um, OK, so some terminologies. So region is basically uh, anything that we have like this. That's a region. Uh, we can also, this is also a region. Basically, any subgraph that we've uh, managed to decompose uh, that we kind of arrived at during the decomposition process. Um, boundary is intuitively um, the boundary of a region is basically the vertices at which you've split the graph to arrive at uh, this region. And um, just for the edge case of uh, G, the boundary of G is the empty set. And finally, the separator, uh, this is quite clear. OK, so with that kind of recursive uh, decomposition process, we can build the, the separator tree. And it's going to have uh, the following properties. So at the root, you start with the original graph G. And at every uh, node, you basically have two children. And the union of the two children is going to be U. So uh, it's basically telling you how to split up your graph. So the tree is going to be binary. The height we'll call eta, and it's going to be of uh, height O of log n. And at the leaf nodes, um, there are going to be regions with a constant number of edges. And um, so if you take the union of all the leaf nodes, you should get back the original graph. Um, I spent a lot of time on these diagrams. <laughs> They're very nice. <laughs> OK, so um, and we call this resulting uh, structure a separator tree. And uh, um, a theorem uh, for separator trees is that they can be constructed in nearly linear time for planar graphs. Uh, and that's you know our theme throughout the talk is that everything needs to be nearly linear time. And let's just define a little bit more notation. So. Um, Let's go back to the tree. OK, so uh, for a vertex in the tree, we'll call it a node. And we'll associate kind of the, um, the region uh, with the node. Right? And we'll just refer to it by that. And also, um, in this example here, we have that the height is going to be 2. Uh, so we'll label um, the height of a node to be for example, n4, this is 0. Uh, and of course, the height of h2 is going to be 1. And the height of g is going to be uh, 2. And um, unfortunately, with this definition, um, depending on how the separator looks like, you could have a leaf that's not at height 0, um, because it's really like uh, how many steps it took for you to uh, reach uh, the bottom, basically. OK, so um, for a node in the tree, we use this uh, curly P of H uh, to denote the set of nodes on the path from this node to the root. OK, and we also use this uh, T bracket I to mean the set of nodes at height I in the tree. And we have the following key lemma. Uh, so suppose you have a, a set of k leaf nodes of t. And we take the union of all the paths uh, from those leaf nodes to the root. Then if you look at the boundary, uh, so this is the boundary. 
which remember is a set of vertices that you split your graph at. Uh, then um, summing up the size of all the boundaries, you get uh, this O of square root MK bound. K was the height? Oh, sorry. K is the number of leaf nodes. Ah. Yeah. Uh, oh, I think I was going to do the height and everything here. Um, okay, so I guess, you know, if we take k equals 2, let's say we take this node and that node, then basically what we're saying is that uh, we're going to get all of these nodes in our set. And if we look at uh, the size of the boundaries for each of these nodes and we sum them up, then we have this bound of... Uh, of square root mk. Two. Um, and if you want to refresh it on how to count the boundary, it's uh, you know the these vertices here, uh, these vertices here, nothing at the root, um, these vertices, and finally, um, I think it's like this. So, I mean, in, in this context, I guess it's like the, the square root of K dependence seems to be the more non-trivial thing because like somehow even just going down any path, you'll see like at most square root of M, right? Uh -huh, right, just right. Just like geometric decay, I guess, of the number of nodes. Yes. Um, yes, that's right. So I, what we're saying is that the, the boundaries um, eventually kind of merge together. Okay, so uh, from this, we also have uh, a natural partition of the vertices of G. And um, how we're going to think of it is uh, every node is going to correspond to a vertex set. So a node H has a vertex set F of H, so that the disjoint union of all these vertex sets gives you back the original vertex set of the graph. And we'll call uh, this set F H to be the set of vertices eliminated at H. And we construct these sets f h from a bottom up way. Um, so at a node h, uh, the vertices that you take is going to be, so h is the uh, subgraph, right? So it has some, um, so v of h is going to be some set of vertices. And some of the vertices in there are already in previous uh, f of h's. And so you don't take those and you take everything that's left that is also not in your boundary. And we'll just further define uh, this fi to be the union of all the vertices um, at a node at level i. And again, the fi's partition uh, the vertices based on the layers of the tree. Um, OK, so. For example, I gotta be really quick here. Um, so you can't take, okay, let's do N1. So you can't take the boundary. So uh, F of N1 is going to be everything that's in the interior, okay? And for N2, um, I think actually, oh, this is the bound, this is all the boundary, right? So. Uh, this is going to be Fn2. And at H1, what you see is that these guys are taken. At... Oh, wait. So this is Fn2 because, I, yeah, OK. Um, so these guys are taken. So these guys came from here and those from there. Uh, and at H1, you can't take the boundary. So what you're left with is um, these two. So those give you uh, FH1. 
Okay, and you do this for uh, every vertex from a bottom up uh, way in your tree. Okay, so what is this actually used for? We haven't really talked about that. Uh, well, let's get back to uh, the projection matrix. And um, so remember in the projection matrix, we have this B transpose WB term, and this is going to be the weighted Laplacian of the graph. And here we know that this L is going to have a rows and columns indexed by vertices of G. Okay, so suppose you can partition the vertices into two sets, uh, F and C, then you can uh, use trilocity so that's the decomposition, and you get this formula for writing out what your L is. And here, um, the subscript just means uh, the submatrix indexed by F. And the short complement comes up, and this is going to, we call it the short complement of L onto C. And we're elim here we're eliminating uh, vertices in F and keeping the vertices in C. Okay, so um, I think Jan mentioned this yesterday. Uh, so the short complement uh, actually corresponds to doing block Gaussian elimination on L. And uh, again, the vertices in F are eliminated and basically you're doing Gaussian elimination and you stop after uh, eliminating uh, those F rows and columns. And we have the property that what you get in the end, uh, this short complement is actually the weighted Laplacian of a new graph on the vertex set C. Okay. And since it's a weighted Laplacian, uh, then we can do this uh, Schlossy decomposition again recursively. Uh, oh, yeah. And um, a little caveat here it's connected to electrical flows and it has connections, it, it basically um, has something to do with computing the effective resistance in your circuits, which basically means, you know, you take out a vertex and you can kind of say something about how much, uh, how much uh, resistance all those edges that you took out actually has uh, an effect in your graph. Um, okay, so let's do recursion here. So. Uh, this is the first step that we just showed, and we'll label everything with this uh, zero uh, superscript. And now we're going to partition. Uh, so this true complement lives on C, lives on C zero, and we're going to partition that into versions, into sets F1 and C1, and get the following. And what we're going to do is, um, Eventually, we're going to plug this into uh, there. And you can pad some identities and zeros to make the dimensions work out. And we're just going to do that uh, recursively until we get to um, some C eta. That's going to be the empty set. Um, okay, and this is the final uh, expression for L that we get. Okay, and um, every U here is going to be an upper triangular matrix and it's going to uh, have blocks that correspond to blocks of uh, Li and some sort of like multiplication between blocks of Li. Okay. Uh, so back to short complements, there are two uh, kind of, sorry, just checking where my slides are. Okay, so we're going to actually use this L for um, our projection matrix. And so the question is to kind of maintain these, uh, or maintain or calculate these uh, Ls and these matrices in this expression, basically. So uh, jump back. Jumping back to short complements for a little bit, um, there are two useful properties for short complements. So one is uh, transitivity, basically. So taking that short complement uh, onto some set Y and then taking the result and taking it onto some set X is actually the same as just directly taking the short complement onto that set X. 
And another useful property is uh, that you can decompose true complements. So suppose um, you have some graph G with Laplace and L, and you also can write that as L1 plus L2, and that corresponds to decomposing the graph G into L1 and L2. And also we have the condition that uh, the vertex set of L1 and L2 intersect on some set C. Then you can write the sure complement uh, as a sum of the two sure complements. Okay. And from this, you can already kind of see that this is like, you know, um, you have a tree and you're splitting it up into two children and this is, you're doing something on an edge in a tree, you know. Something's happening. Okay, so um, that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're going to uh, use our separator tree that we just built to maintain some form of short complements. And what we're, what we're doing exactly is going to be uh, at every node H, we're going to maintain this. Um, this is in fact a Laplacian. Um, and we define it recursively as follows. So for a leaf node, um, we're going to define it to just be the Laplacian of that subgraph H. Okay, if you're a non-leaf node, then suppose you have two children D1 and D2, uh, and we have uh, by the property of our separator tree that H is going to be exactly D1 plus D2. And here, when we add two graphs, we mean, you can think of it as adding their Laplacians and taking the graph that is the, that corresponds to the resulting Laplacian. Um, and we'll define this L subscript H to be some sort of uh, recursively defined sure complement. Um, and we'll explain what's happening in just one second. And um, just so we're kind of clear on what's happening, this LH uh, is going to live on the vertex set uh, FH union, the boundary of H, okay? Um, I don't seem to have a diagram here. Okay. Uh, so let me just draw something very quickly then. What's happening here is basically, um, we're going to be kind of recursively eliminating vertices, right? And say we have this uh, H and children D1, D2. Then basically what we're doing is going to be, we're saying that um, eliminating everything uh, and you've got the rest of your graph up here. And what we're going to say is that um, if we take the short complement onto of the entire graph onto uh, what remains in the graph, then that's the same as if we um, first take the short complement of the entire graph onto uh, this part. And then, which means, you know, you're getting rid of these vertices uh, and then getting rid of these vertices, and then finally get, getting rid of uh, the vertices in FH. It's a little confusing. Okay. I'm not sure if that made sense to anybody. Okay, so, um, right. So I define these LH, and actually we have this very nice um, uh, formula, which says that the sum of LH for over all the H's in the same level of your separator tree is equal to L superscript I, where remember LI is uh, defined in our, um, um, expression for this overall Laplacian L. Just 
how how were these uh, like LIs, I guess, related to the separator tree? Or is, is there no relation? Um, uh, so these guys are um, LI, right? And this is equal. To, so um, in the separator tree, what we're keeping is LH uh, at every node H. And LI is, is equal to the sum of um, basically whatever is on your level. So TI. So what, what the, the level is how far down you are from the, yeah, so what was the level? Actually? Yeah, well, so I guess um, if you draw your tree and and you kind of do like, a, you label the, the height based on your distance from the root, uh, then it, the level goes from zero up to eta, yeah. I see. So you're just taking the slices. Yeah, you're taking the slice. And actually, um, if we were to be very careful about this, because I've been not very careful about uh, the zeros and the dimensions of these matrices, um, then actually what we have is, if this is Li, then um, Li is going to be indexed by um, these Fh where H is in level I. So um, actually what we have is going to, it's going to look like a block diagonal matrix where on the diagonal you have these LHs. And so you sum them up together, you get Li. Okay. Right, so, um, right, this is actually fairly straightforward to prove, and we get something, we say, some, we can say something about this uh, matrix Li. Okay, and um, in our definition, we have these true complements, and in our algorithm, we just replace all the exact true complements by approximate true complements, and they're going to be also sparse, uh, and we denote them by this tilde notation. And they're computable in time, nearly linear in the number of vertices of LH. So uh, it's a graph and has some number of vertices. Okay. And when we say approximate, we mean in the spectral sense. And uh, when we say sparse, we mean that the resulting graph, uh, so this Sure, complement is the Laplacian of some graph. This graph has a nearly linear number of edges. Okay, and um, so remember we have, uh, we've defined these LHs at every uh, node of our separator tree. And these Laplacians, remember they were a function of some edge weights. And so now suppose we have some edge weight changes and we wanna update all these short complements that we're maintaining in the separator tree. Then um, suppose K edge weights change, uh, then we can update everything in uh, the square root MK time again. So again, this has to do with uh, the lemma that we had, um, which bounds the size of the boundaries over all the the paths from these uh, nodes to the root. Okay, so that's our separator tree, and now we can quickly move through the IPM data structures. So remember again, we have our projection matrix, and we've replaced this uh, B transpose WB with L inverse. And uh, remember our goal was to find some approximate projection matrices. So here we're going to approximate L inverse and conveniently we already have um, quite a good approximation uh, just from our separator tree. And here, uh, I know it looks like the same formula as before, but we're going to um, think of everything. Um, oh, computations are going to be with approximate sure. Okay, so then 
L is not an exact, uh, it's not exactly the Laplacian, but rather uh, some spectral approximation of the Laplacian. And this is based on how good your sure complements are. Okay, and if you have uh, an approximation for L, then you have one for L inverse as well. Uh, and just to point out here, each of these pi i is going to be lower triangular. It has uh, ones on the diagonal and then Otherwise, it's only supported on some submatrix indexed by this CI by FI. So it has mostly zeros everywhere, uh, mostly zeros in that matrix. Um, okay. So uh, for our projection matrix, we're just going to, aha, I knew what I wanted to do. So I'm going to uh, call this giant thing gamma for now, just to simplify our notation. Uh, and we'll just write out our approximate projection matrix to be um, where we replace L inverse with uh, this entire thing. So here is our L inverse. And this is enough for our Slack projection matrix. Okay, so, uh, so you know, we know what the protection matrix is. Now we have to actually talk about how to compute uh, the steps for um, to compute um, a slack change step. So in order to do that, um, let's talk about something uh, in between, which is going to be um, this intermediate computation Z. Uh, so remember, we have this projection matrix, and we're going to just define Z to be the partial computation. So Z is up to uh, gamma here. Yeah. And uh, we have just a fairly straightforward theorem, which says that we have this data structure that can compute Z uh, if you have a k sparse vector V as input um, then we can compute Z uh, in this O of square root MK time again. Um, and the key idea here is by, you have to look at kind of the non-zero patterns in, uh, in these pi i's and actually realize that they kind of correspond to paths in uh, our separator tree. Okay, and also if we have edge weight updates, then notice that this W is going to change and also all the pi i's are going to change. Uh, change in W. Um, but our data structure can still support um, future computations uh, using the updated weights and to make this change to the updated weights, we still just require this O of square root MK time. Um, okay, then basically we're almost there for the slacks. So recall we wanted to implicitly maintain the slack. Um, so this is our step. And what we're doing is we have the partial computation up to Z. Uh, and actually at this point, uh, this is actually very costly to compute. So we just don't do it. We leave it in this form. Um, but uh, one key thing is that we need to break up Z uh, into two terms where Z previous kind of corresponds to, uh, to Z from previous iteration. And we have some Z sum, which kind of just, you throw out all your other uh, leftovers into Z sum. And um, once we have uh, Z in this representation, we can actually change, uh, we can change this representation in very good time whenever we have um, this new step with the T, TH times V. And that's because we know that V changes um, sparsely between iterations. Okay, so basically 
we're good for uh, maintaining um, the Slack and updating the Slack. And for the flow, I'm going to really quickly go through it. It's actually really cool. So um, instead of finding this uh, projection matrix that's approximately what we want and also uh, satisfies the feasibility constraints, um, so we're not going to write this out in closed form, but rather we'll just compute uh, some flow, which is a weighted flow because actually it's a flow multiplied by a weight uh, matrix. And this weighted flow is going to satisfy uh, this constraint. And if you have this, then you can define uh, P tilde uh, times V to be uh, v minus this flow, and then you can check that indeed to the two conditions that we want are actually satisfied. Okay. Um, so, the f so remember now we're looking for some sort of weighted flow, and the first condition is that f this f tilde needs to be kind of close to w one half v l inverse d, and uh, remember from the introduction that this is actually the electric flow. And we're just uh, multiplying it by a weight afterwards. So uh, yeah, so we have a combinatorial interpretation for how to do these updates. And suppose we were actually able to just take an exact, to take F tilde to be exactly this expression, then we can see that, um, again, we'll have B transpose W one half F tilde equals D so that it satisfies the feasibility condition um, for our IPM step as well. Um, okay, so basically what we're gonna do is we have uh, this demand and it turns out we can magically decompose the demand so we can write D as a sum of uh, demands, where every demand correspond to a uh, node in the separator tree. And actually, uh, this demand has the following uh, formula. Um, and Z here is our uh, intermediate calculation. Two more minutes and I'll be done. Um, and now the idea is that for every D uh, in this sum of demands, for every term in this sum, we're going to uh, route them separately in the graph. And we use this, um, we use the separator tree structure, right? So how do we route this demand D uh, associated with this node H? So remember, we have this recursive definition of um, LH. And for the case where H is a leaf node, we route the demand uh, just directly on this particular subgraph. And what we're doing is just, what happened? Almost shut up. Ah, very <laughs> I'm actually almost done. Okay, so yeah, so you're, you're routing within. <laughs> um, yeah, so routing within electric demand, uh, electric flow on the subgraph associated with H only. Uh, so normally you would be routing on the entire graph, right? Okay, and um, if H is not a leaf node and it has children D1 and D2, then remember we have uh, this recursive formula for LH. And so we can write this recursively as uh, the following. So this is LH, of course, and um, you split up the two terms. And basically what we're doing is we're just multiplying identity uh, to each of them. So the demand values are not changed, but we have split up one demand into two demand terms. And this one is actually now you can see if we define this to be some Z prime, then this is a demand living on uh, 
the region D1 instead of H to begin with. So originally we were routing on H and now we're routing on D1. So this way we're kind of pushing the demand down uh, around the graph until we get to the bottom at which we just route using an electric flow. Uh, I won't do an example and uh, that's it. <laughs>